In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace." For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only begotten God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gospel according to John, and we thank you for the opportunity to think together about it this evening. We pray that you would open our minds to understand the scriptures. We pray that you would help us to grasp the scope and the the depth of the gospel of John. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to think about the beginning of the gospel in light of its end and its corresponding parts in light of one another, and we pray that you would give us deep, deepening, growing insight into the Lord Jesus and what John intended to teach about him. We pray this, Lord, that we might abide in him, that we might walk with him, that we ourselves might believe him, and that by believing we might have life. And we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that you would convict us and comfort us and humble us and build us up. And we pray that you would equip us to do the work of the ministry, to proclaim the good news to others, to do our part in the Great Commission. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to think with you tonight about the Gospel of John, and I am going to try to uh, give you an overview of the Gospel of John that I hope will help you to think about its individual parts in light of the whole and the whole in light of the individual parts. And and I also hope that uh, by the time we're done tonight, you will have a grasp of the contents of the Gospel of John. You'll have a better knowledge of the Gospel of John than you had when when we came in here tonight. Um, As we begin, I I just want to stop for a moment and marvel at the genius of this man, John. Think about the task he had to undertake. He had to write, he was was called of God, moved by the Holy Spirit, and, and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write of the most important man who has ever lived. And he tells us at the end of his book, he tells us in John chapter 21, in, verses, in, in, in verse 25, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So he's telling us he has more material than the entirety of the world could contain. How does he select what to put in? And how does he choose how to organize this material? And what he has accomplished is 
without question, one of the most significant pieces of human writing in the history of the world. John's gospel, I think you'll agree with me, is one of the most profound parts of the Bible. So when we consider that ending, that that were everything to be written down, not even the world would contain the the books that could be written, I, I I would invite you to consider that against the very beginning of the gospel. Okay, so with those last words of the gospel in mind, think of the first words of the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made with Him, made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. I don't think when John writes at the end, that if everything were written down, not even the world could contain the books, I don't think he means to limit his consideration to just the things that Jesus did during his earthly incarnate life. I think he means for John 21, 25 to be read particularly in light of John 1, verse 3, all things were made through him. And it's then that the world could not contain the books. When when we consider everything that he did as God in the making of the world and, and in the creation of the cosmos. And what I've just done is I've just read the beginning of the gospel in light of the end of the gospel, and I want to suggest to you tonight that this is the way that John intended his gospel to be read. He intended his his gospel gospel to be read as a chiasm. So the word chiasm uh, comes from the Greek letter chi, which is shaped like an X. And you take, you take one half of that X and it, it forms this chevron shape. And, and what I want to do is I want to give you headings for the chiastic shape of, God's, of John's gospel in the hope that it will, it will function as ancient authors intended these things to function. And that is, for one thing, as an aid to memory. So I'm going to challenge you tonight to memorize my headings of the chiasm, and I think it's going to give you handles and, and almost, uh, maybe you've heard of this, this concept of a memory palace, where uh, these people who, who are memory athletes, they engage in these amazing feats of memory. Uh, one of the things that they'll do is they'll take a, a building or a, a big, like a palace that they know very well, and then they will place things that they want to remember in various rooms around the palace. And then when they want to remember those things in sequence, they just take that walk around the palace and pick up the things that they wanted to remember that they put in those rooms. So this chiastic structure is going to serve like a memory palace for you. And and I'm hopeful that by the end of the night, you'll all be able to walk through uh, the chiastic structure of the Gospel of John that I'm going to give you and that it will result in you knowing the Gospel of John. And if you're not convinced by by the chiastic presentation that I give you, this will still serve you. It will still give you the, the, the contents of the Gospel of John. So that's, that's one big reason authors would use chiastic structures as an aid to memory. Another big reason authors would use chiastic structures it, it pertains to some things that I just alluded to. I just spoke of the way that, that if John is going to write the life of Jesus... He needs something to structure the presentation, and he needs something that will provide boundaries for the presentation, something that will will allow him to know, here's where I'm going to start, and these are the sections that I'm going to work through, and here's where I'm going to finish. So this chiastic structure is going to to give John uh, shape, boundaries, and, and, and sections for him to work through. It's also a vehicle for artistic beauty. If, if you embrace this idea and then you contemplate it, I think you'll, with me, I think you'll step back and say, the Gospel of John is like a magnificent cathedral. Yes, it communicates the message of the most important man who ever lived, but yes, it is also beautiful in itself. And, and, and I would further argue that the structure, it, it, it delivers the meaning. You, maybe you've heard people say, the medium is the message. The structure helps to, uh, to, to convey the message that John is trying to get across. Uh, and then also, these structures, what they do 
is they put the parts in relationship to one another. So like, like what we've just done with the beginning, through him all things were made, and the end, not even the world would contain the books, and, and those two statements begin to interact with one another and deepen and, and mutually interpret one another. And again, I think that this was intended by the author. This is the way the author intended the message to work. So we're going to use this room, and we're going to, we're going to walk across the parts of this room for my, uh, my chiastic structure of the Gospel of John. And so um, that, that side of the room, that first row of pews over there, we're going to treat that as John chapter 1. And, and I want to suggest to you that the big idea in John chapter 1 is that Jesus, the Word, uh, John 1.14, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And then later in chapter 1, you remember that John the Baptist testifies and he says, I would not have, kn- have known him had not the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain, he it is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, I think these, these things are in relationship to one another, Jesus being the Word, the ESV renders this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but the word translated dwelt is the, the Greek term used to, to speak of the Lord tabernacling among his people in the tabernacle. So it has overtones of the dwelling place of God in the wilderness after they built the tabernacle at Mount Sinai. So Jesus is the word who tabernacled among his people. And then you remember what happened in Exodus 40 when Moses got the tabernacle built, the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And and what happened right there is that God by his spirit took up residence in that tent that the people of Israel had made. And so also here in John chapter 1, Jesus, the Word, became flesh and tabernacled among among mankind, and then at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down upon him to remain upon him, and it's as though the tabernacle was filled with the Spirit in the same way that it was in Exodus chapter 40, in the same way that the temple was in 1 Kings chapter 8. And then uh, at the end of John John chapter 1, you remember Jesus says to Nathanael, truly, truly, I, tell, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And perhaps you remember that that alludes to Jacob's vision of that, that stairway into heaven, and he named that place Bethel. And Beit El in Hebrew means house of God. And so in John chapter 1, there are these very significant themes having to do with Jesus coming as the fulfillment of the temple. Jesus comes as the fulfillment of the temple. What is the significance of that? Well, the temple is the place where God is present. It's the place where God dwells on earth. And the temple is also the place where sin is dealt with. So Jesus comes in fulfillment of the temple, the place where God is present, the place where sin is dealt with, and just like the temple and the tabernacle before that, Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he is the house of God. We'll see more having to do with this as we move through John's gospel. John chapter 1, the word tabernacled and spirit-filled. Now, the corresponding set of pews on the other side of the room, at the end of John's gospel, it, it, it uh includes everything from John chapter 20, verse, uh, verse 19 through, through the end of the gospel, 21, 25. And what, what I think is most pertinent in that unit, beginning in John 19, what happens at the end of the gospel there is Jesus appears to his disciples on the day that he was raised from the dead in John chapter 20, verse 19. And when he appears to them, um, he enters into that room where the doors were locked, so he's in a glorified body that is not subject to the limitations that, um, that our bodies are subject to. He enters into that room, and he says, peace be with you, and then he shows them his hands and his side, and then he breathes on his disciples and says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I think what Jesus is doing he goes on to say, um, 
or uh, sorry, right before that, right before he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, he says to them in John chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So the Father sent Jesus to be the fulfillment of the temple. Jesus is now sending his disciples to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. You think of, John, of Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And so Jesus is saying to his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathes on them in John chapter 20, verse 22, and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 1, the word tabernacles and is filled with the Spirit, and then in John 20 and 21, the temple of the Holy Spirit, that is believers, the church, uh, receives the Spirit, and Jesus sends them as he was sent, okay? So um, we're, we're going to remember the beginning of the gospel, John 1, as the Word tabernacled and filled with the Spirit, and John 20 and 21 as um, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We'll just leave it with that. The temple of the Holy Spirit. But I've filled in the details. You know what I'm talking about. So how are we remembering John chapter 1? That's a real question I want someone to tell me. What's in John chapter 1? Somebody say it. Thank you. The word tabernacled and filled up the Holy Spirit. What's in John 20 and 21? Yeah, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus sends them as he was sent, and he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So that's how the gospel opens and closes. Okay, so first and last units. We're going to treat this aisle as the second unit and this corresponding aisle on this side of the room as the second to last unit. The first unit treats John chapters 2 through 4. And um, in the first of those episodes, in John 2, uh, 1 through 11, Jesus goes to Cana of Galilee. And in Cana of Galilee, he turns water to wine. In the last of those units, it, at the end of John chapter 4, this is John uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 43 and continuing through the end of chapter 4 in verse 54, he returns to Cana of Galilee. And in the first of those units, in John 2, 1 through 11, he was at a wedding on the third day. And in John 4, 53, you'll remember the Samaritans, he's gone to up, up into Samaria, and he's talked with the Samaritan woman, and the people of her town came out, and they begged him to stay, and so he stayed there two more days. And then after the two days, he returns to Cana of Galilee. So that makes it what day? The third day, that's right. So John 2, 1 through 11, on the third day in Cana of Galilee, John 4, uh, 43 through 54 in Cana of Galilee after two days on the third day. And those two miracles, the turning of water into wine and the healing of the official son, they are very similar to one another. In, in the water to wine, they come to Jesus. Jesus' mother comes to him and she says, they have no more wine. Wine, And he says, what does this have to do with me? And, and then she says, um, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So, you know, she comes and wants him to fix the problem. He, re he initially rebuffs her, and then she communicates her faith in him, do whatever he tells you, and then he gives instructions, and John doesn't actually narrate the miracle happening. The miracle happens off, off stage, offset, so to speak, and we only see the results of the miracle. You know, Jesus gives instructions, go fill the jars with water, and draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. They do so, and the master exclaims, this is the best wine. And, and, and the miracle has taken place. The same, same kind of thing happens at the end of chapter 4, where the official, the royal official, comes to Jesus, and he says to him, um, his son is ill, and he, and he goes to him and asks him to come down his, and heal his son. And Jesus initially says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So there's this initial rebuff, just like, what does this have to do with me? And then the official says to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And, and just like Mary, do whatever he tells you. The official express faith, expresses faith in Jesus. And then Jesus says, go, your son will live. And again, the miracle happens 
off set, off stage. And, and as he was going on his way, the servants come and tell him that his son was made well and, and, and began to get better at the very hour that Jesus spoke the word. So those two miracles frame John chapters 2 through 4. And, and so we're going to use the phrase, from Cana to Cana, to summarize John 2 through 4. And it's a, it's a very balanced section um, in, in, in that, that whole unit uh, after, um, after the miracle of, of, of the water being turned to wine, Jesus cleanses the temple uh, in the rest of John chapter 2, and then he converses with Nicodemus, and then John the Baptist testifies about him, and that's the central unit. And then the conversation with Nicodemus actually sits across from the conversation with the Samaritan woman, and it's like a study in contrasts. You have this Jewish religious leader being compared with this this outcast, immoral woman, and yet they both need Jesus in their own ways. They're they're totally different people in society. He's a Jew, he's a he, and he's a Jew. She's a she, and she's a Samaritan. He's a Pharisee and a teacher of the law, and she's a woman who's now um, had five husbands, and the man she has now is not her husband. And yet they both need Jesus. So there are these corresponding structures in the gospel, but that whole unit, John 2 through 4, goes from Cana, to Cana. It corresponds, so that's, what's the first unit again? The Word tabernacled and filled with the Spirit. Uh, Second unit, from Cana to Cana. Last unit, the temple of the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, so I send you, breathes on them, receive the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, From Cana to Cana, the second to last unit, John chapters 18 through chapter 20, verse 18. So, I think our chapter and verse numbers are a little bit off. They need to be adjusted to the, but, but that's not going to happen. So we'll just deal with it. John 18 through 20, we're just going to call it that. John 18 through 20, guess what? It starts in a garden and it ends in a garden. So we're going to say from garden to garden. So two, for, two through four, we've got from Cana to Cana. 18 through 20, we've got from garden to garden. And the way this goes, in, in, at the beginning of John chapter 18, This is where Judas leads the cohort of Roman soldiers out to find Jesus, and he's in a garden. And this is such a remarkable passage. I'd love to uh, take the rest of the evening and just exposit John 18 with you. But on this occasion, Judas comes out to, to, with, with the, the Roman soldiers and, and, and the guard, and, and they've got torches and swords and so forth, and Jesus steps forward to meet them, and he says the words, whom do you seek? That's what he says in the garden. And, and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And it's as though there is this revelation of his glory because all those soldiers, they draw back and fall to the ground. It's as though the Lord Christ has revealed himself in his glory and knocked them down in his majesty. And they, he lets them up. And, and they come back to him, and he says again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these go free. And it's, it's like the gospel in, in miniature. Uh, he is giving himself for the sake of his people. That's, that's what Jesus came to earth to do. So it starts in a garden in John 18, verses uh, 1 through 11. It ends in a garden. And if you look at that passage over in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18, um, what, what happens here is uh, Mary is weeping outside the now empty tomb. And she sees Jesus, but she thinks he's the gardener. And, she sa- and he, uh, um, she's, she's already interacted with these angels. And Jesus says to her, woman... And this is John chapter 20, verse 15. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And it's the, ex- and the so the ESV has translated this slightly differently, but it's the very same question in Greek that Jesus had asked in the first unit in John 18, 1 through 11. Whom do you seek? Now he says to Mary, whom do you seek in this setting of, of a garden? So 
The first unit in John 18 through 20 is set in a garden, and the last unit in John 18 through 20, John 20, 11 through uh, 18, is also set in a garden, and the same question is asked in both units. Whom do you seek? And then within those two units, you'll remember that after they arrest Jesus, what happens? They take him away, and who follows? Peter and John go running after him. And they get to the the home of the high priest, and John goes in because he's known to the high priest, but Peter has to stay outside, so John goes to the woman at the gate and speaks on Peter's behalf and gets Peter in. That's the second unit in John 18. The second to last unit in John 20, the first part of John 20, Mary comes to the disciples and tells them that the tomb is empty, and what happens? Peter and John go running to the tomb. And John gets there first, just like in John 18. And he doesn't go in, he looks in, and then Peter arrives, and he goes in, and then then John goes in. So these units are structured to to mirror one another. Okay, so our second to last unit, there's much more that I could say about that. That whole unit in John 18 through 20 centers on the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Jesus being crucified is at the very middle of that unit of John 18 through 20. Uh, From garden to garden, John 18 through 20. So uh, somebody call it out. What's John chapter 1? John 1, 14 plus John 1, 29 through 34. John 1, 14, the word tabernacled, the word tabernacled, and the Spirit came down upon him to remain. The word tabernacled and Spirit filled. John 20 and 21, the t- temple of the Holy Spirit. That's right. John 2 through 4, from Cana to Cana. That's right. John 18 through 20, from Garden to garden, that's exactly right. Okay, so we've already learned uh, John 1 through 4 and John 18 through 21. I mean, I know that we're, we're summarizing and um, there's a lot more material, but, but we, we can do the rest of it relatively quickly. And then we're going to come back uh, in our next two sessions and, and work through this in more detail. This middle section of pews, we're going to divide it into three parts. Okay, so we're going to have the first third of it, the middle third of it, and the second third of it, okay? And the first third of it, we're going to treat as John 5 through 11. And, and we'll come back, and I'm, I'm going to have more to say about this in our, in our next two sections. Um, so, so let me just quickly draw your attention to what's going on in John 5 through 11. Look at John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Now, this feast is not named, But the next one is, look at John chapter 6, uh, verse 1. After this, notice uh, John 5, 1 and John 6, 1 start with the same words. After this, I think it's metatauta in in Greek. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Galilee. And then John tells us in verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So John 5 is set at an unnamed feast. John 6 is at the Passover. And in In both of these chapters, really in all these chapters, John 5 through 11, Jesus is not in private, he's in public, and he's among crowds. And then look at John chapter 7, verse 1, starts the same way. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee, and then in verse 2, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. And then, um, I think we're still at the feast of booths in John chapter 8, Um, And then when you get over to John chapter 10 in verse 22, we read, at that time, the feast of dedication took place in Jerusalem. And then in John 11 um, verse um, 55, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. So I'm going to summarize John 5 through 11 with these words, Jesus is in public, among crowds, at feasts. Okay, John 5 through 11, Jesus is in public, among crowds, at feasts. And that, stand, that first third of this middle section stands in contrast with the last third of the middle section, which runs from John chapter 12, starting in verse, um, starting in verse 20, and running through the end of chapter 17. And if, if, if you have a red letter Bible like I do, you can see that most of John 13, 14, 
15, 16, and 17 is all in red. Jesus is talking. And, and you're probably aware that this is what happens on the night that Jesus was betrayed. All of that stuff that Jesus says in John 13 through 17 happens on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And he's not in public, he's in private. And he's not with crowds, he's with only his disciples. And it doesn't happen at a series of feasts over multiple years it happens at this one final Passover feast. All of that material is happen, happens on the night of, of the night on which he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. So John 5 through 11, we're going to summarize with the words, in public, among crowds, at the feasts. And then John 12 through 17, we're going to summarize with the words, in private, with the disciples, at the last feast. Okay, and that, that really summarizes those, those, those units for us. And that brings us to the central section of John's gospel. And to talk about the central section of John's gospel, I want to talk about the first section of John's gospel. Okay, so I want to go back to John 1, 1 through 18, which I read at the beginning. And, and I want to suggest to you that John, it, John 1, 1 through 18 is almost like the, the entryway into the cathedral of John's gospel. And in the same way that sometimes the entryway will be a microcosm of the big thing, that's the way it is here. So back there in the back, there's sort of a, a beginning of this, this room, a kind of entryway that is structured the same way the rest of the room is on a smaller scale. That's what John 1, 1 through 18 does. So uh, the way that 1, 1 through 18 is structured um, you have one, one through five, which is all about the Word who was with God in the beginning. And that stands across from one, 16 through 18, which is all about um, how from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And then verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. So, you have this, these themes of Jesus being God and revealing the Father in 1, 1 to 5 and in 1, 16 through 18. And then I wonder if you've ever wondered about this. In 1, 6 through 8, you have this unit on John the Baptist. And then when you get down to verse 15, you have another little statement about John the Baptist. And, and I would suggest to you that the reason you have 1, 6 through 8 about John the Baptist, and then 1, 15 about John the Baptist is because those two statements stand across from one another in this chiastic structure of John 1, 1 through 18. So it starts and ends with Jesus, second, John the Baptist, second to last, John the Baptist. And then look at John chapter 1, verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So light, look at John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Well, glory is often um, uh, thought of and, and spoken of as emanating light. And, and so the light, the true light in 1.9 stands across from the glory of the only begotten from the Father in 1.14, and that puts 1.10 through 13 at the very center. And in 1.10 and 11, He was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. They rejected him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So at the center of John 1, 1 through 18, you have some who reject him, but those who receive him become children of God. So you have rejection and reception of Jesus. It's the same way at the center of the gospel where we find, if you look with me at, at John 11, verses 53 through 56, look at John eleven fifty-three. 53. So from that day, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. And then look at uh, verse 57. The chief priests and the Pharisees had given ordered orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. That's the rejection. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. By contrast, the reception of him is in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, where we read of how um, six days before the Passover, um, Mary and Martha and Lazarus 
give a dinner for Jesus, and at that dinner, Mary anoints his feet with this expensive ointment, and the the house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So at the center of the gospel, you have uh, the establishment rejecting Jesus, and then Mary and Martha and Lazarus receiving Jesus. And then just outside that, corresponding to one another, right, so right before the, re- the rejection section in 1153 through 57, you have that, that section where the high priest prophesies that it's better that one man should die than that the whole nation should perish. And that's in John chapter 11, verse 50, and, 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 and John explains in verse 51, he didn't say this of his own accord. Right before that, look at John 11, verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Now, look at what happens right after the reception section in 12, 1 through through 8. In 12, 9 through uh, 19, you have the triumphal entry. And um, look look at what the Jews say In verse 19, the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So this is what they feared in 1148. 1148, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then uh, 1219, everyone's going after him, essentially is what they say. So that central unit really consists of four parts. Um, You have this prophecy, it's better that one man should die then that the whole nation should perish, and then the rejection, and then the reception, and then the triumphal entry. We're going to remember that central section with four letters, B-R-R-T. And you can, I'm going to do something funny that I hope you'll remember. Brrt, okay? Brrt, that's what's at the middle, okay? B-R-R-T, brrt. Better that one man should die than that the whole nation should perish. Rejection, reception, triumphal entry. That's That's your central section of John's gospel. We're going to take a break. We'll come back, and there's going to be a quiz at the beginning of the, of, of, of the next section, and we're going, to, we're going to review the entirety of the Gospel of John, of John according to this chiastic structure.